This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a man, Martin Hill, phoning an estate agent in order to find some accommodation. First, you have some time to look at questions one to three. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Hello, Brindle's estate agents here. How may I help you? Oh, good morning. I'm ringing to see what flats you have for rent at the moment. Right. Can I start by just taking your name, Mr... Um... Hill. Martin Hill. Right. And are you looking for a flat for yourself or um, a family, perhaps? Well, it's for three of us. Myself and two friends. We're going to share together. I see. Um, what about employment? Are you all students? Oh, no. We've all got full-time jobs. Two of us work in the central bank. That's Chris and me. And Phil, that's the other one is working for Hallam Cars, you know, at the factory about two miles out of town. I'll put you down as young professionals then. And I suppose you'll be looking for somewhere with three bedrooms? Yeah, at least three. But actually, we'd rather have a fourth room as well, if we can afford it, for friends staying over and stuff. Is that with a living room to share, plus kitchen and bathroom? Yeah, that sounds good. But we must have a bathroom with a shower. We don't mind about having a bath but the shower's crucial. OK, I'll just key that in. And are you interested in any particular area? Well, the city centre would be good for me and Chris, so that's our first preference. But we'd consider anything in the west suburbs as well, really. Actually, for Phil, that'd be better, but <laughs> he knows he's outnumbered. <laughs> but we aren't interested in the north or the east of the city. OK. I'm just getting up all the flats on our books. Now you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Just looking at this list here, 
I'm afraid there are only two that might interest you. Do you want the details? Okay, let me just grab a pen and some paper. Fire away. This first one I'm looking at is in Bridge Street and very close to the bus station. It's not often that flats in that area come up for rent. This one's got three bedrooms, a bathroom and kitchen, of course, and a very big living room. That sounds a good size for you. Hmm. So, what about the rent? How much is it a month? The good news is that it's only four hundred and fifty pounds a month. Rents in that area usually reach up to six fifty a month, but the landlord obviously wants to get a tenant quickly. Yeah, it sounds like a bit of a bargain. What about transport for Phil? Well, there'll be plenty of buses, so no problem for him to use public transport. Uh, but unfortunately, there isn't a shower in the flat, and that location is likely to be noisy. Of course. Okay. What about the other place? Let's see. Oh yes. Well, this one is in a really nice location on Hills Avenue. I'm sure you know it. This looks like something a bit special. It's got four big bedrooms and、um, there's a big living room. And oh, this will be good for you—a dining room. It sounds enormous, doesn't it? Yeah, it sounds great. That whole area is being developed, and the flat's very modern, which I'm sure you'll like. It's got good facilities, including your shower, and of course, it's going to be quiet, especially compared with the other place. Better and better, but I'll bet it's expensive, especially if it's in that trendy area beside the park.、Mm, I'm afraid so. They're asking eight hundred pounds a month for it. Whoa! It sounds a lot more than we can afford. Well, maybe you could get somebody else to move in too. I'll tell you what. Give me your address, and I can send you all the details and photos, and you can see whether these two are worth a visit. Thanks. That would be really helpful. My address is flat five. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part two. You will hear a tour guide welcoming a group of visitors to the British Library, and telling them about the library and what they will see there. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to your very own tour of the British Library on this lovely afternoon. My name is Tony Walters, and I'm your guide for today. Could I please see your tickets for the guided tour? I'd also like to remind you that any tickets bought today do not include a visit to the reading rooms. I'm afraid we don't do visits on Fridays or any weekday during working hours, so as not to disturb the readers. 
But if you do want to see those rooms, the only day there are tours is on Sundays. So, I don't want anyone to be disappointed about that today. Okay? Thank you. Right, we'll start with a brief introduction. As many of you know, this is the United Kingdom's National Library, and you can see that this is a magnificent modern building. It was first designed by Sir Colin St. John Wilson in 1977, and inaugurated by Her Majesty the Queen more than 20 years later in 1998. As you can see, the size is immense, and the basements alone have 300 kilometres of shelving and that's enough to hold about 12 million books. The total floor space here is 100,000 square metres, and, as I'll show you, the library houses a huge range of facilities and exhibition spaces, and it has a thousand staff members based here in the building. So, you can appreciate the scale of our operation. In fact, this was the biggest publicly funded building constructed in the United Kingdom last century. It is still funded by the government as a national institution, of course, and it houses one of the most important collections in the world. The different items come from every continent and span almost 3,000 years. The library isn't a public library, though. You can't just come in and join and borrow any of the books. Access to the collections is limited to those involved in carrying out research. So, it's really a huge reference library for that purpose, and anyone who wants to consult any materials that are kept here can formally apply to use the library reading rooms. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Right, well, here we are, standing at the meeting point on the lower ground floor, just to the right of the main entrance. I've given you all a plan of the building so that we can orientate ourselves and get an idea of where we'll be going. Now, Outside the main entrance, you'll see the wide piazza with the stunning sculpture of Newton. The sculptor was Paolozzi, but it's based on the famous image by William Blake, and it's definitely worth a closer look. On the other side of the piazza from the statue is the conference centre, which is used for all kinds of international conventions. We'll take a quick look inside at the end of our tour. Looking ahead of us now, you'll see that we're standing opposite the staircase down to the basement where you'll find the cloakroom, and to the left of that we have the information desk where you can find out about any current exhibitions, uh, the times of the tours and anything you need to know if you don't have a tour guide. As you can see, on this lower ground floor we also have a bookshop. That's the area over to the left of the main entrance. You'll be free to browse there when we get back to the ground floor. Now, opposite the main entrance on this floor, we have the open stairs leading up to the upper ground floor. And at the top of them, in the middle of the upper ground floor, you can see a kind of glass-sided tower that rises all the way up through the ceiling and up to the first floor. This is called the King's Library. It's really the heart of the building. It was built to house the collection that was presented to the nation in 1823 by the king. You can see it from every floor above ground. When we go up there, you'll find the library's treasures gallery on the left. Uh, can you find it on your plan? That's the exciting one. <laughs> so we'll be visiting that first, but we'll also take a look at the stamp display situated behind it on the way to the cafe.
Uh, a lot of people miss that. The cafeteria runs along the back of the floor, and in the right-hand corner, you'll find the lifts and toilets. <laughs> Always good to locate them. The other main area on that floor is the public access catalogue section, and I'll show you how that operates when we get up there. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two geography students talking. An older student, called Howard, is giving advice to a younger student, called Joanne, on writing her dissertation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi, Howard. I haven't seen you for a while. Oh, hi, Joanne. Yeah, they're keeping us really busy on the postgraduate programme. Mm -hmm. But how are you? You'll be starting your dissertation soon, won't you? Yeah, tutorials start next week. I've got Dr Peterson. You'll remember it all from last year, of course. Oh, it's not something you forget easily. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, although I didn't expect to enjoy writing my dissertation, and in fact I didn't really find it much fun, mm. I wouldn't have missed the experience. I found it really improved my understanding of the whole degree programme, you know, from the first year on. Right. So what are you doing yours on? Glaciated landscapes. Although I haven't decided exactly what aspect yet. Mm, I did mine on climate systems, so I can't help you much, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll be fine once you start your tutorials. Dr Peterson will help you focus. I know, and he'll set me deadlines for the different stages, which is what I need. My concern is that I've got tonnes of material on the topic and I won't be able to stick to the word limit, you know. Mm, I remember I had different concerns when I was doing my dissertation. Last year? Yeah, before my first tutorial, I did a lot of fairly general reading because I hadn't fixed on my topic at that stage. Mm. I actually enjoyed that quite a lot and really improved my reading speed, you know, so I was getting through a lot of material. I was frightened I wouldn't remember it all, though, so I got into the habit of making very detailed notes. So, did you find your tutor helpful in getting you started? Yeah, we certainly had some interesting discussions, but it's funny, I saw a brilliant programme about climate change, and it was that that really fired me up. Mm. It was talking about some recent research which seemed to contradict some of the articles I'd been reading. Mm. Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So you say your tutorials start next week? Yeah. Well, the first month's crucial. You've got to meet your tutor and decide on your focus, but don't become too dependent on him. You know, don't see him every week, only when you want to check something. Right. Once you've got the focus, you've got to get reading. Mm. It's helpful to look through the bibliographies for all the course modules relating to your topic and get hold of any books you think you'll need. I haven't got much money. I mean, get the books from the library. Far better. And I suppose I should prepare a detailed outline of the chapters? Yeah, absolutely. But don't feel you have to follow it slavishly. It's meant to be flexible. OK. Now, I'm someone who likes to get writing quickly. I can't just sit and read for a month. <laughs> Not like me, then. <laughs> <laughs> but if that's what suits you, you know, your natural approach, then you really ought to start immediately and write the first chapter. Right. Now, Joanne, about the library... Mm. It's worthwhile getting on good terms with the staff. They aren't always helpful with undergraduates. I suppose they focus on postgrads more. Maybe. But show them you're serious about wanting to do good work. And what if I can't find what I need? Well, there's interlibrary loans. Borrowing books from other libraries. But I've heard it isn't all that reliable. Mm, you're right, but you probably won't need it anyway. Be positive. <laughs> The library is likely to have most things you need. And during the dissertation writing period, you can take out 15 instead of the usual 10 books. Should I look at previous year's dissertations? You can do. But I won't know which are the good ones. The library only keeps the best, and the staff can advise you. Are they willing to do that? Oh, yeah. And I'm worried about getting journal articles from the electronic library. Well, have you tried to find any yet? No. Well, you should. It's really straightforward. That's obviously something I'll have to look into. Dr Peterson will help. Yeah, I know I can go to him if I have any worries. Except he will be away in the second month. Oh. It's the holidays. You should ask him what to do while he's away. Gosh, yeah. But I suppose I can get a lot of support from course mates. I know a couple of people who are thinking of doing the same topic as me. Take care. Collaboration can become dependency. I think better see how that works out, what the people are like. You're probably right. About other reading, I suppose Dr Peterson will recommend plenty of good articles to get me started. One thing I'd find out is what his attitude is to internet sources. Surely not in this day and age. I'd better get that sorted out right at the beginning. I would if I were you. And I've also got some questions about the research sections. How much time I should spend explaining the process? Well, I think that's up to you. You can see how it develops as you're writing. OK. It's the same with things like time management. That's something a tutor can't really help you with. I agree. So, is there anything else you need me to go over? That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear a psychology undergraduate describing the research she is currently doing on expertise in creative writing. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. 
For my short presentation today, I'm going to summarise the work I've done so far on my research project to explore expertise in creative writing. Essentially, I'll share with you the process I underwent to gather my interim findings. First of all, I should give a little relevant background information about myself. Before I started my current degree course in cognitive psychology, I studied English literature. And, as you can imagine, this meant I spent a great deal of time thinking about the notion of creativity and what makes people develop into successful writers. However, the idea for this research project came from a very specific source. I became fascinated with the idea of what makes an expert creative writer when I read a well-known 20th century writer's autobiography. I won't say which one at this stage, because I think that might prejudice your interpretation. Anyway, this got me thinking about the different routes to expertise. Specifically, I wondered why some people become experts at things, whilst others fail to do so, in spite of the fact that they may be equally gifted and work equally hard. I started to read about how other researchers had explored similar questions in other fields. I began to see a pattern that those studies which involved research in a lab were too controlled for my purposes, and I decided to avoid reading them. I was quite surprised to find that the clearest guidance for my topic came from investigations into what I call practical skills, such as hairdressing or waiting tables. Most of these studies tended to use a similar set of procedures, which I eventually adopted for my own project. I'll now explain what these procedures were. I decided to compare what inexperienced writers do with what experienced writers do. In order to investigate this, I looked for people whom I regarded as real novices in this field, which proved easy, perhaps unsurprisingly. It proved much harder to locate people with suitably extensive experience who were willing to take part in my study. I asked the first four to do a set writing task and, as they wrote, to talk into a tape recorder, a technique known as Think Aloud. This was in order to get experimental data. Whilst they were doing this, a research assistant recorded them using video. I thought it might be helpful for me in my transcriptions later on. I then asked four experienced writers to do exactly the same task. After this, I made a comparison between the two sets of data and this helped me to produce a framework for analysis. In particular, I identified five major stages which all creative writers seem to go through when generating this genre of text. I think it was fairly effective, but still needs some work, so I intend to tighten this up later for use with subsequent datasets. I then wanted to see whether experienced writers were actually producing the better pieces of writing. So I asked an editor, an expert in reviewing creative writing, to decide which were the best pieces of writing. This person put the eight pieces of work in order of quality, in rank order, and using his evaluations, I was then able to work out which sequence of the five stages seemed to lead to the best quality writing. Now, my findings are by no means conclusive at this point. I still have a long way to go. But if any of you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them and go... That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.